Are you tired of having to constantly teach your friends that are new to Don't Starve Together how to play the game? Are you tired of having to explain every single detail about the basic mechanics like combat or crafting? Do you want to convert your friends from new players just starting out in DST to players experienced and informed enough to handle themselves on their own without having you to hold their hand the entire time? Well my friends, I have great news for you! This video aims to solve all those problems by being a complete tutorial on all the basics that a player needs to know in order to survive. I beg to all of you that this video is shared with all new players alike in order to get people into Don't Starve Together and become somewhat competent. But enough said, let's get into it! Make sure to like and subscribe. But first, like any typical PC gamer nowadays, the first thing that we need to do is flock over to the settings tab. From here, we only really need three settings changed. The first setting that you need to change is lag compensation. This should be turned off at all times. As someone who was a supporter of lag compensation back then, I can proudly say that lag compensation is a quick way to get your character killed really quick. I just said really quick twice in a single sentence. Oh my god. To summarize, Don't Starve Together has very slight input delay. That delay becomes significantly greater depending on your internet connection. Lag compensation allows you to play the game without this delay at the cost of making certain tasks and me mechanics appear slower. I understand having the slight delay is a little bit of a hurdle, but it is a hurdle you must get across. And trust me, it really isn't that bad once you get used to it. The only time that I do not recommend lag compensation to be turned off would be if you have either abysmal internet or you literally just cannot play with input delay, which again, the Don't Starve's input delay is not that bad, trust me. Although then again, if you do have bad internet while playing this game, like whatsoever, you are much better off either playing the game solo or not playing at all. Just saying. Because at that point, having lag compensation on or off will not improve the quality of your game if your internet is that awful. Do yourself a favor and turn it off. You will thank me later. The other two settings that are actually completely up to you, unlike the former, are screen shake and backpack overlay. Let's start with screen shake. Screen shake is pretty self-explanatory. When there are big things on the screen or an earthquake, the screen will shake. I personally like to turn this off like many other games, but it's completely up to you. The other setting is backpack overlay. This basically changes where extra storage slots that you get from wearing certain objects on your character appear. I like to have this as integrated so it appears with my main inventory. Again, this is all up to you and your personal preferences. Okay, that should honestly be all that I need to cover in terms of settings. Let's get to making a world. When you initially click the host game option, you will be prompted with some world types. Ignore all of these for the time being and just click the survival button. This is what I consider to be the traditional game in a sense. Now here's your world. In all honesty, we really only have to change two options in order for you to get started on learning the game. First, change the amount of players from six to one. You can make this lower or even higher with mods, but just in case you don't want random players to join your world while you're learning how to play the game, we'll keep this just one player for the time being. Next, click on the forest tab and then the world generation tab. You are then gonna scroll down until you see the starting resource variety. Now, you really don't have to turn on this setting if you don't want to, but turning it to classic ensures that your world does not generate with twiggy trees. TLDR, twiggy trees are just a much worse sapling in my opinion. Again, it's up to you and your preferences. Alrighty. Once that is done, you can generate the world. It might take a little bit because the game has to generate both the overworld and the caves, but uh, we'll explain that another time. Or you can just look up another video. Okay, so you're finally in the game and you are probably met with a giant list of characters to pick from. Unlike most survival games, DST makes you choose a survivor or character to play as, rather than playing as your own character in a sense. Each character has their own upsides to aid in their survival, and downsides that change certain aspects of the game and challenge you as a player. Now, traditionally, I would honestly tell most people who have a good understanding of the game to play whoever they want. I'm not one to force people to play the game, how like they should play it or like my ideals, whatever. However, for new players learning how to play the game, 
It is imperative that you pick Wilson when learning the ropes of this game. Every survivor in DST alters a playthrough in many ways via their perks and disadvantages. If your first experience playing this game is with characters like, let's say, Weber, Wormwood, Warley, Wirt, that don't even play Don't Starve in a relatively normal playstyle like other characters, it will really mess with your knowledge and understanding of the core mechanics and behavior of mobs in particular. You also might adopt some habits like basing your spiders as Weber or basing the swamp as Wirt that might be good on those characters, but are terrible on others. Please, do you and your friends a huge favor and pick Whistlin' until you have a solid understanding of the game. However, if you are very insistent on playing other characters, go right ahead. Me personally, I would only recommend Wilson for new players. Finally, we are in the game at long last. So before I start teaching you the basic mechanics of DST, I'll quickly run through all the controls that you'll need to know. Pressing WASD allows you to move your character. You can also left click to move around and even hold down the left click button on your mouse to move towards your cursor. Personally, I recommend WASD in general and especially during combat. Q and E allow you to rotate the angle of your camera or screen. Doing this doesn't really give you any advantage other than for building bases. So either do this for your own content or just don't do it at all, as it does mess with your sense of direction. Holding spacebar allows you to interact with nearby harvestable objects or interactable objects as I call it. This can be in the form of picking up an object from the ground or picking grass tufts and twig saplings. Clicking on both of these types of resources will also work as well. If you haven't seen already, the bottom part of your screen has an inventory. You hover your mouse over an object in your inventory to examine and do other things depending on the item. You can click on the item to drag it similar to Minecraft. You can then move it to different parts of your inventory to organize. Alternatively, you can drop items by clicking and moving it outside of your inventory and then clicking on the ground. You can also hold control and either shift, control, or both at the same time to drop items beneath your feet. Also, See those three slots at the far right of your hotbar? Those are your head, body, and hand slots. Pretty self-explanatory, that's where you equip tools, hats, armor, backpacks, weapons, etc. Attacking! Combat! Pressing and holding the F key will make your player target the nearest aggressive mob, whether it is aggroed on you or not. It's important to note that you can cancel the attack before you actually hit the enemy or object by simply moving with WASD before the attack happens. Alternatively, holding Ctrl and F at the same time will target the nearest entity no matter what it is. This includes pretty much anything from friendly mobs to just straight up walls. Use this with slightly more caution or do as mentioned before and move around with WASD before the attack lands and hits the entity. Both of these methods of attacking mobs and other entities both have their pros and cons. However, I don't plan on going too in depth into combat, so Take of that what you will. Lastly, crafting. On the left side of your screen, you'll see an icon with two hands and a goofy little spherical thingy. I, I have no idea what that is. Clicking this will open up the crafting menu. Again, pretty self-explanatory. You've probably also noticed that there is actually tools already on my screen that I am able to craft. These are called crafting shortcuts. Rather than having to open up the crafting menu over and over again to craft items like torches or pickaxes, you can instead make a shortcut for that item. It's kind of like a macro, but an actual in-game feature. This is completely up to you if you want to do this. Find an item you wish to craft, click on it, and then go to an empty shortcut slot and click on that. Hooray! You now have a shortcut for crafting that said object and no longer have to go into the crafting menu to dig for that recipe over and over again if you don't want to. You'll also probably notice that there are some things that you aren't able to craft at all, whether you have the resources or not. This is because there are a crap ton of items that you need to prototype, quote unquote, at either a science machine or an alchemy engine, depending on the item. Prototyping in DST is basically just crafting the item once at a crafting station in order to learn said recipe. After you do that, you won't need to a crafting station to make that item any longer. Anyways, I assume if you found the crafting menu, you probably already made yourself a tool. You can equip tools in your hand slot by right clicking on it or left clicking and moving it to your hand slot. Now that you have a tool in your hand, you can now interact with different resources you couldn't interact with before like trees, rocks, and other objects. Alrighty, that should be most of the basic controls covered. If I miss something, it will probably be in the comment section where others will call me out on my mistakes, so make sure to check those out. 
Now onto the nitty gritty stuff. As you've probably have noticed, looking at the top right of your screen displays four circles indicating different things. The first one is the clock. This is how DST measures time. Every time the clock makes a 360, that is equivalent to an in-game day. You've probably also noticed that the clock has three different colors, yellow, red, and black. These colors indicate the stages of time during the day. Yellow is equal to day, red is evening, and black is night. All of these stages of the day fluctuate depending on the season you are in. For the sake of time, I will not be covering seasons in this video. Basically, just think of it like real life. In the summer, the days are longer, while the nights are longer in winter. Now onto your stats. Underneath the clock, you have three other circles indicating your statuses. Going from right to left is your health, sanity, and hunger. Health and hunger are pretty straightforward. You lose hunger over time by not eating food. When your hunger meter runs out or you are hit by external threats, you lose health. Once your health reaches zero, you die. Very easy to understand, like imperative in most video games. Now, that's where I draw the line, because unlike the health and hunger statuses that are pretty standard for 90% of survival games nowadays, sanity is where DST branches off from all of its competitors. Simply put, sanity is the stat that determines how mentally stable you are. There are many ways that your sanity can decrease and also many ways your sanity can increase that I will not get into since that is not extremely important to let you all know. What is important is what happens if it does get low. Over time, you'll notice that as your sanity decreases, your game will become more and more desaturated and filled with spooky ambient noises. Both of these traits increase more and more the lower your sanity gets. Getting lower also starts making shadow creatures appear in, around your screen that move around to scare you. It also starts turning certain creatures like bunnies into their shadow variants. Ultimately, all these shadow creatures will not harm you at all except for two. Speaking of those two nightmare creatures, when your sanity does eventually reach low enough, your whole screen will have a reddish veiny outline and the intensity of the sounds will reach its all time peak. When you are in this state of complete insanity, the nightmare creatures previously following you and not seeming to do much of anything, suddenly become extremely aggressive and begin to attack you. Now on paper, this sounds horrendous. And for most new players who aren't great with combat and don't know how to fight nightmare creatures, it is. However, being able to kill nightmare creatures grants you the resource known as Nightmare Fuel, one of the most important resources in the entire game. Additionally, the sanity stat will play a much bigger role for certain boss fights and other interactions in the future. But don't worry about that. If you are watching this video, you're probably a new player after all. So TLDR, lowering your sanity makes you go crazy, go crazy enough, and the scary monsters start spawning. Very simple to understand. Well that's about it in terms of stats. Now you can move on to the tips on surviving your first autumn. So first off, we're going to talk about this. Whoa, 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 and, uh, whoa, whoa, there. Slow your rolls there, Tom. There's still one more stat that we still need to cover. I I'm, I'm sorry, what? What do you mean another stat? There's only three stats there. What else is there to cover? Well, my friend, what if I told you there's a hidden stat? <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, the last stat that I forgot to mention is temperature. Now, likely said before, temperature is actually hidden from the player unless you use mods. The temperature stat refers to the player's body temperature. The lower or higher your temperature stat is, the colder or hotter you are. If you're cold enough, you'll start to freeze to death. If you're hot enough, you'll overheat to death. Pretty straightforward. Temperatures fluctuate throughout an in-game year depending on what season it is. But you won't have to worry about that if you're simply learning the game in the season of autumn, where seasons and seasonal weather is pretty much the least of your worries. Wait, but what was the point of telling you all this if you don't even have to care about- Oh my god. Finally, let's talk about the game itself and what you should be doing in your first autumn. By the way, autumn in DST lasts for around 20 in-game days. However, before I talk about tips and advice, it is extremely important, and I do not say this lightly, extremely important that new players understand how the lighting system in this game works. Just a heads up, if a player does not know how the lighting system and darkness in this game work, they will not survive a full day, ever, period. In most survival games, nighttime is the spooky scary time of the day. It's super dark. Monsters come out to kill you, etc. And while DST shares those similar qualities with its nighttime, it is also simultaneously extremely unique with how it goes about darkness. Instead, nighttime being somewhat dark with a little bit of visibility for the player, darkness in DST is just straight up pitch black. Nothing is visible whatsoever in darkness, not even your own character. In addition to that, if you are in the darkness for too long, 
you will start to hear some hissing noises after a little bit. After the hissing noises, you are followed by your player proceeding to take a hundred damage. It will repeat this until you die or you reach a light source. This, this is one of the core threats that you will face in a DST playthrough. So how do we tackle darkness? With light. Light sources are items, structures, and entities that emit a radius of light that repels the darkness within its radius, making everything in that radius visible. Standing in said radius will prevent you from being killed to darkness. And that's that's really it, honestly. All right, enough said about light. Let's talk about the actual game and some little basics that you'll need to do to survive. The most obvious thing you want to do is keep your character alive. Scavenge for food to raise your hunger and sanity, as well as avoiding any enemies that might kill you or you're not confident in fighting. However, that's pretty basic and easy to do and a given for most video games out there. So here are some actual tips that you should generally be doing in your first autumn. The most important tip I can give to new players is focus on exploring the map. If you haven't noticed, as you've been walking around the world, you'll see that your map has slowly begun to uncover. By the way, press M to open up the map. I don't know if I mentioned that. That is because at the beginning of a playthrough, your map is quote unquote unmapped, and therefore you need to uncover it by exploration. The best way to map out your world in the most efficient way possible is to trail the edges of the world. Doing this for around 8-10 to 10 in game days will complete most of your map for the most part. This also solves the issue of trying to figure out where everything is in your world as you most certainly should know where everything is by now given that you've mapped out your world. It is also a good idea to go into the caves at least once or twice to collect light bulbs and that way you can craft yourself a lantern later on which is just a far better torch. That's pretty much all the tips I have at least all the tips I can give you without going off on a literal tangent. Personally, other than basic controls and mechanics, my personal belief is that this game is best learned throughout your own experiences and mistakes you make. And even if you don't want to learn the game that way, there are hundreds of videos out there from a multitude of channels that cover pretty much every aspect of the game that you can think of. So if that's how you want to learn the game, check out those channels. Hell, I'm just here to teach you the basics every player should know. And that's it. If you've made it to the end of this video, thank you so much for watching and make sure to subscribe to the main channel for more high quality videos like this. You can also subscribe to my alt channel, Pickles Private, where you'll see a lot more slop content like let's plays, gameplay videos, commentary, etc. I'll be posting on there pretty much weekly, so go check that out if you're interested. Who knows, I might actually live stream too. Anyways, that's it for me. See you in the next one. Later.